You know, Dre, that is a really good Indianapolis 500. Like, one of the best I've seen in my life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, like, I know that, like, the rest of the season is kind of a slog. And I know not every fan is going to stick around. But, hey, at least we can look forward to, like, a good start to an incredible championship run. There's so many storylines. And it's all going to kick off at a very interesting race in Detroit, right? Like, what's the worst that could possibly happen out of this weekend? Um, how does... 12 penalties, 8 cautions, 47 laps of yellow, and not one, but two PR nightmares. We really can't have shit in Detroit. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Hello, everyone. You know, you heard me talk a lot, if you heard our last episode on uh, Motorsport 101, a lot about bikes. I feel like I'm going to be a little bit less vocal about this IndyCar race, because if I say what I could say, we will get taken off the air. <laughs> or or you, or you would just uh, hang out with Troy Weaver now. Uh, sorry, former Pistons GM Troy Weaver to keep it keep it locally themed, because this is the Detroit Grand Prix weekend. They you know, it's billing. amazing. We figured out a way to make the Detroit Pistons the second biggest shit show in Detroit. Wow. Oh, oh, that is. That takes take some doing. That is a tough act to follow. Um, welcome to the Little Caesars Arena of uh, IndyCar races. <laughs> you know, this weekend really brought out the worst in everybody. And it really shouldn't be like this, because like, what's 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 not to like about an IndyCar IMSA double billing weekend? The last one of the season, you have two major racing series sharing the same track, uh, good local turnout. What's not to love? And as it turns out, IMSA ended up being a messy race. Shout out to Ricky Taylor and Felipe Albuquerque finally winning one after. Over 600 days without an IMSA Premier Class win, that was good. Shout out to Felipe Nazar, still him. One of the great double, triple, quadruple overtakes you'll see if you go back and watch the highlights. Definitely Scotty contender at the end of our season. Definitely in contention for the Golden Melon, but it ended up being a mess otherwise. And then we thought, well, at least IndyCar is just one class. Nope. Yeah. No, no, our our optimism, our smile and optimism gone after what a couple hundred feet of racing. It didn't start off great, and then it got worse. And before that even happened, it began even worse because, well, if you have nothing nice to say, you probably shouldn't say it at all. By the way, I'm Dre Harrison. Welcome to episode 522 of Motorsport Hey, Dre, 101. how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Hi. Uh, I, I forgot I host this show every once in a while. Um, yes, uh, we can't have shit in Detroit. I'm Dre Harrison. There are Jay O'Connell and Cam Buckley. Glad yeah. you could join us as ever. We will eventually talk about the nasty nature that was the Detroit Grand Prix and everything outside of that, too, over the next hour or so. But I can't really add much more than to what RJ and Cam's already alluded to. This weekend was like that time Mike Tirico loses his shit at the New York Jets, where it just goes <laughs> kicked around on the ground. That's the way this the race way should end. <laughs> That's the way the Jets season should end. Ugly. <laughs> Ugly and a loss because that's what this weekend was. This was it was a loss for everybody unless your name is Scott Nitson because yes, we really fucked around and let Scott Nitson take the number one spot in the points table. Not only it, that, you gave him a double digit point lead to leave Detroit with. Like, how have we done this again? This is a collective failure by everybody involved in IndyCar that you've let you fucked around and let Scott Dixon take control of the championship at the almost halfway point. What are we doing here? Um, yeah, there's not very many people who didn't cover themselves in shame over the course of this Detroit Grand Prix. And we'll try, and I, and I, I, I cannot stress this enough. Try to make sense of it all over the next hour or so. But I'll quickly tell you where you can find us. If you want my full thoughts on this entire weekend, not only is there a review of MotoGP 
um, at Italy. It, it, well, there wasn't much to it. There was also a full race review of the IndyCar Grand Prix at Detroit um, on their website, motorsport101.com forward slash blog. Check out the website. And I even did a backup extra written piece breaking down all the big stories we've not even talked about in the last hour and a quarter. Esteban Ocon leaving the Alpine Formula One team, by the way. We uh, didn't we'll even talk, about, talk about the fact that Alpine tried to sack him on the down low and then Ocon invoked French labor law to be like, actually, no. No, that's not how this works, Bruno. Um, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be the French without a dispute over labor laws. I've got to love the French for something. Um, so we'll talk about all of that on the website. And of course, it'll be in our next podcast. We'll get about the Canadian Grand Prix early next week. But of course, you can also back us financially on Patreon. If you really like us, patreon.com forward slash motorsport 101. Five bucks gets you early access to all of our content. Ten dollars gets you in the supporters club of our Discord server. We can listen to these episodes live as they're being recorded which is what zoe kira and jason are all doing right now we had steven in in here as well earlier thank you all so much for listening you guys were clearly hyped for this edition of the show so don't not that i blame you this is going to be a a spicy meatball to say the least but thank you all so much for your continued support and for listening in of course if you'd like to follow us on elon musk's failed business investment you can at dre harrison 101 at rj o'connell and at c buckley 911 Seven, Of course, you can also follow us on Instagram, Motorsport 101 Pod, Motorsport underscore 101 on X, and YouTube.com forward slash Motorsport 101. If you want to listen to our podcast on YouTube, you can. You can do that over there now as well. Subscribe for all good things. Um, and I'm in the comment section, so you can, you can say hi to me That if you want to do that. That's, that's a nice thing to do. Right, I could put this off no longer. Uh, we can't have shit in Detroit, but we've got to review it anyway. After this, let's review... IndyCar's Detroit Grand Prix. Scott Ditson has won his 58th IndyCar race uh, with another masterful fuel save. Marcus Erickson and Spudge the Demons of an awful month of May at Indianapolis to finish second. And Marcus Armstrong got his first IndyCar podium. Hell, Tristan Vautier, who hasn't driven an IndyCar in seven years, get, wins the Dale Coin Racing 51 sweepstakes and is running as high as third, probably would have bagged himself a top 10 finish if not for the fact that he was on the wrong tire strategy. But apart from that, this race was a mess. We had Eight cautions out of the 100 laps run. We had 47 of them run under caution. Shout out to Oriel Servia leading the most laps of the day. Second place was Scott Nitson with 35, called by Colton Hurry, your pole sitter on 33. 12 drivers took penalties during the race. Four of them were served by Will Power. Dre, did you see the IndyCar graphic that says Sunday was sur- unreal for Will Power? He, the graph of his position looks like an EKG monitor. I have like, seen this graphic. It is it is as insane he as He started sounds. eighth. He drops to 27th after being caught in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven car track blocker which mm-hmm. involved aforementioned Tristan Vautier, by the way. Mm-hmm. He, he then fights his way, in seven years. <laughs> he then fights his way back to third, gets more penalties, drops back to 23rd, and ends up finishing sixth. And he couldn't even... <laughs> uh, he pulled out the Cillian Murphy gif of just him looking completely confused as to how he ended up there, but somehow finished in sixth. I love that James Hinchcliffe tweeted him just a roller coaster emoji because there is no better way to sum that up. It looks like he was riding Fort Park's Colossus. It, it just it just wasn't ideal at all. Um, I could break down all eight of these cautions, by the way. Um, we had, as RJ alluded to, a uh, seven-car blocker on the opening lap. Um, due to power being clipped by Paul Cher, Christian Lungard's in the middle, um, power spins into the outside wall, there's a stack up with Ferrucci, Pado, Vortier, Rossi, Harvey, and Lundquist. Lap, so lap 16 of the second caution to Tino Ferrucci, spinning out Helio Castroneves at turn five, and then uh, Kiffin Simpson drives into Helio's stricken car. That's caution number two. Caution number three, McLaughlin locks his tires at turn one, spins it into the outside wall. This is the point where it rains briefly. 
it baits two thirds of the field into switching to rain tires. It's not really wet enough for wet tires. It dries out very quickly. Oh, and you're missing um, the other part of this too. <laughs> At some point, they don't know how the field's supposed to be ordered. So this caution drags on to the point that by the end of it, the track's starting to dry, and everybody who went and some people who went on a wet actually switch back to slicks. Yeah, it was an eight lap long caution. And when they got going again, and immediately on the restart, there's another three car bottleneck into turn three. Power around the inside of Grosjean, but then he hits Renus VK, who's trying to go the long way around the outside of the corner. They hit each other. VK's in the wall. Another caution. Everybody's back on slicks again by that point. During that round of pit stops, Joseph Newgarden runs over one of Christian Lungard's pit crew's ankles um, and gets a drive-through penalty for running over his equipment in the pit lane. That's an automatic drive-through in IndyCar. Um, we got going, and then another immediate caution, this time Colton Herter, um, missing his breaking point at turn five so badly, he goes straight into the outside wall and takes Tristan Vortier with him. Yeah, um, uh, after after his comprom- strategy had already been compromised, like, <laughs> oh, brother. At this point, the IndyCar safety car has been put, st- has had to stop and be refueled in between. Didn't Shane- we have this little good to Sega? Yeah. Shades of Monterey 2023, as they would say, because we've now hit Florida man levels of crazy, as Cam Buckley said during the race itself. Um, Caution number six. um, We have another bottleneck at turn three, three wide, Lungard, Armstrong, and Grosjean this time. Lungard goes down the inside, misses his breaking point. He clatters into Grosjean. Armstrong backs out of it, and then Lungard ends up enacting Rule 34 on the Junkos car. At this point, we have had 20 consecutive laps without a, without a lap under green flag running. That's how bad it is. We've not gone back to the flag in 21 attempts. And then caution number seven, McLaughlin punts Stingray Robin to the wall um, on lap 63. And then on the back of that restart on lap 70, New Garden goes for a lunge at turn three, doesn't make the corner hits the side of Carl Kirkwood's car, and then he blocks Alex Pelot, who's entering. And that ended, by the way, Alex Pelot's run of 25 consecutive top 10 finishes. He ended up finishing in 16th. The last time he finished an IndyCar race that far back was Portland. 2022 was the last time Pelot finished an IndyCar race as low as in 16th place. In the end, you know what? Uh, you know what I find wins. like the funniest thing about this bot score when I look at it. There was only one official retirement. It was Christian Rasmussen who had a mechanical failure. His engine blew. Yeah. <laughs> His engine blew. I'm, I'm just, you notice, I've gone, blue you notice I've gone fairly quiet during this segment because I'm just I, I'm just taking in the grandeur of all this nonsense. <laughs> the, the one that gets me is 20 straight laps of caution. 40 yeah. minutes in the middle of, ra- of the race where we didn't get a full racing lap. On the green. I swore yeah, like, it was like at, at, at points of the race is just like thinking – when somebody, when they, when the field makes its way down to the end of East Jefferson Street in the hairpin turn three, I'm just thinking, oh, geez, when, when are we getting it? Because it was like that at points of the IMSA race, too. Yeah. At least with that, you have the excuse of like it's multi class traffic around a, a street course that is very, very narrow at parts. So narrow, in fact, that when people to Ronnie spun during his qualifying attack lap, he, he did the Austin Powers bit. Uh, yeah. uh, he did the Austin Powers bit where he's trying to reverse back and forth in a hallway that is not big enough to, to let him do this. Yeah, it was a, a lot of a lot of track blocking was the name of the uh, person involved at in that point. point. <laughs> yeah, as you do. Um, that was a, that was a, that was a, that was a forty five minute block in this race where we didn't get a lap, and I was just like, I am mentally checked out and fed up. Amazingly. After 75 laps, where we had eight cautions, we actually got a race break out of this demolition derby at the end, and Dixon won with another masterful fuel save at the end. And delighted for Marcus Ericsson, who, my God, needed needed a result after, you know, after fucking a horrible month of May. Yeah. Um, a a month of May so horrible that some people were wondering, like, should, should Andretti sack him now? 
which I oh, think yeah. was just and then, and a then, load of nonsense. And then he was debatably the only, like, Kirkwood's race was fine. Colton Herta. Blue oh, and Herta race. was at four. Because he, he, you know the, oh boy, I'm ready to win. Fuck you meme. Yeah. Colton Herta is both pictures. Shout out, to, just, shout out to not fifth gear on Twitter, by the way. Long yeah, suffering Colton funny. Herta super fan. Very funny guy. This is now the second race in a row where Colton Herta looked like he had a terrific race car. The previous race, of course, being the Indianapolis 500. And he just threw it away all on his uh, own. Oh, brother. Yeah, it's I, never I, a good sign when you mess up a move so catastrophically, people think it's a brake failure at first. Yeah. Like, I wasn't sure whether it was on purpose at, at first because he was that far out. It was, it was, it was really, really bad. Um, for those keeping score at home, I want to say it's now 33 races since Colton Herter's last win at Indianapolis in 2022. How has he gone cur- more than two years without a win? He's too it's, good for this. A lack, and it ain't a lack of speed. And it ain't a lack of speed out of Andretti either. He's won in his side gig too. Mm-hmm. Once, but he has. It, it, it was a, it was a big win though. I have to say it that, was a huge it, win. No, no, to take nothing away from it, but like we were talking about this guy as like, is he like the future of this series if he continues on this trajectory? And we were just, talking about him as the future of AlphaTauri. At least one person was, and I and I still to this day believe that like the curse of the AlphaTauri rumor is hanging over his neck like a burden that he just can't shake. His only curse is himself, and I love him as a driver, but it's he just is trying too hard. He just like this, he, he this whole series, it shouldn't shock me anymore. These driving standards with IndyCar are not new. We have all lived through the Nashville events. Mm-hmm. And yet, in this very same week where Joseph Newgarden is on is on a, a talk show talking about uh, punching up at Formula One. So oh, the any usual. of us could go. Any of us could go and rock it in F1. He makes an ass of himself and the entire series is just globally embarrassing itself. What are we that, doing? That was the thing. Like you could make an argument Joseph wasn't even the worst of the Penske's out there for 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 just silly driving over the course uh, of this Scott, race. Scott just crashed himself out mid race. And and then and then he punts out Stingray <laughs> Rob despite being a lap down. I I, I, I <laughs> What? Scott McLaughlin, who in, in his first job, damn near unbeatable on street courses, and in his second job has a track record of damn, being damn near unbeatable on street courses, just has an awful day at the office. And Joseph Newgarden, the less said about this weekend, the better. When you needed to follow up the Indy 500 win <laughs> with strong results to at least give your supporters the hope that you can make another desperate second half title push that maybe falls short at the last hurdle. That wasn't it. Well, well, if anything, he, he put, he put one of his main rivals out of contention for the day because Alex Palou looked like he was going to commit a heist on this field in terms of points right up until the point where he couldn't. Polo was one of the few people out there that didn't drive like a total bozo the entire the entire race, and of course he gets rewarded with his race being ruined through no fault of his own. Like, He's very fortunate that like a lot of his other title rivals like also had like really tough days. Like he could be more than just the eighteen points out that he is right now. Yeah, the problem yeah, is like, that he's 18 points down on Scott fucking Dixon. Yeah, the man who's had one bad weekend all year. Like, like it's it's like he was nowhere in Barber. Besides gave, that, he's been Dixon, classic Dixon. <laughs> you, you all just gave Scott Dixon. Established Scott Dixon. An 18-point lead at the halfway mark. And I'm sorry, Good that luck was with also... That. That was the worst I've ever seen Joseph Newgarden drive an IndyCar. That was shambolic. He, oh, that, that was pretty bad. I, I expect better from, I mean... A two-time series champion in Indianapolis 500, a two-time Indy 500 winner? Yeah, yeah one of the, I don't he, disagree. I, I expect better from a Penske driver, period. 
I mean, uh, and this is, this is Penske's backyard. This is General Motors' backyard, man. Yeah, yes. In the, <coughs> in, in the in, race in that the General Motor Motors, City, in the General Motors race. The Renaissance Center is in the background covered in Chevrolet Sorry, billboards. The Renaissance Center, uh, who has the title sponsor of the Renaissance Center in Detroit? But that Chevrolet. would be General Motors as a whole. And yeah, how did uh, these races go? Um, they got swept by Honda on the weekend. Honda, Honda one, one, two, oh, three, two, three, four. four. Yeah. And they won the IMSA race. And Rexy, the Porsche, won GT in IMSA despite a Corvette front row lockout. Whoops. None uh, of this has gone well for GM. Um, I, which is I, amazing I guess. because Scott Dixon, who won this race... And led a Honda one two three four is now on a plane to France to represent Cadillac at Le Mans because, of course, I'm playing normal. both sides, so I always come out on top. Yeah, well, we'll see about that, buddy. Pan- um, pancakes at thirty eight thousand feet, buddy. Um, this this was, and to to even go beyond the racetrack and not in that section yet. Oh, we got things to say about the things that occurred off this track. Um, you know, you'd think this is the first race after the Indy 500. You would take that momentum and you would advertise the shit out of that next race to get those people who you got during the 500 to tune into the rest. Of this. Uh, no, no, they didn't advertise this race until about three days prior. So here's the thing. It ended up being such a mess at points that people were asking, like, are you sure they wanted to promote this? Well, you shouldn't be same, going, you shouldn't be going the, into races <laughs> expected a shit show. I mean, yeah. to, to the same effect of if a 10 out of 10 happens and no one's around to watch it, did it ever really happen? If if an are you fucking kidding me out of 10 derogatory happens. And no one's around to watch it. Did it really happen? I know it happened for me. 5.3 million people watched that 500 on average. It peaked at over six during that incredible finale. 600,000 watched on cable this weekend. You know what's crazy? That's that's one of the top five largest viewing figures for IndyCar and basic cable in the last few years since NBC took the rights. And I wonder what they think coming out of this weekend. You know what what they're probably thinking? We should take more money... We could take more money if what if what's been written in Marshall Pruitt's mailbag of racer.com is people believe like we should take less money instead of like, you know, guaranteeing like every race on free to air network television in the United States. Yeah. <sighs> like, you know, do, do, when, do, when I because when I think what's gonna get eyes on my series, I think the Fox equivalent of ESPN eight the Ocho. Oh yeah. Credit to our supporter Kira from Discord. Mm-hmm. Who came up with camera. that earlier? That you couldn't put it better if you tried. Yeah. Okay. The, like, it's like all of the goodwill I felt towards IndyCar after that 500 has been flushed out immediately. So, about the event itself, uh, Tony DeZino, who, co- who writes for IMSA and has also covered IndyCar in the past, has laid Good out dude. a number of. A number of like mitigating factors in all of this. So it's just like one, Detroit after Indy's not new. It's been a thing since 2012, and it's been pretty good. It's more of an after anything the last 12 years than like IRL to Texas and Carter Milwaukee in the split years. The downtown shift, and I'm not a Bell Isle guy, but most people would agree that like the Rensen circuit as it's constructed now versus what we had at Bell Isle is the better track, but They had to move it downtown because of local interest, wanted Belle Isle, and they need to keep the stakeholders happy. You need to keep General Motors happy, and especially now if the rumors are believed that Honda has one foot out the door. Um, We've all, and the exhaustion seemed more prevalent this year than most for Indy because it was a longer month of May. We had Esther Ring, the much longer race day of the 500 itself, and that probably led to some of the red miss. And I'll say this, like event ops and volunteers, it seems like they're pretty good at Detroit. The mess that happened is not their fault. No, no. But I I do got to think like if you're GM, if you're the city of Detroit, you got to think of like ways to reconfigure the 
course because you, you need a better layout than this. There's like it, it's not the track. It wasn't organized. exclusive to this because like no. the IMSA race was messy. Bad. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was it was it was a tough watch is how I would describe it. And yeah. I know logistically this is a far better race for Detroit to have and to keep the shareholders happy. You've got you, you, you got to do it, and I understand that. And I don't think this track is inherently the problem. But what I would say is, is that the layout does not help. It, it, the it just layout, the layout it. encourages you to go completely elbows out. And I, I don't mind elbows out racing, but you have to go really beyond standard elbow out I, racing just to make moves. Yeah, I mean, I think it was completely beyond elbows out. So a lot of the moves we saw were just <laughs> it's like awesome. Jacob they, Truba they were, elbows out. They they were some of the they, they were some of the silly shit that we've been seeing and all those funny F one twenty four public lobby clips that have been coming out, only with far <laughs> better handling because oh my god, the handling <laughs> yeah. model the new F one. I game. saw I Woo! saw the I saw the clip of like the Watch cars out. like wobbling upside down like like it's carries mod or something like that that's, but that's crazy you can't this this standard of driving is not acceptable and here's not the thing good. people do turn tune into shit shows because they love watching shit shows do people tune in to nascar weekly races bowman ray do you see entertaining close wheel-to-wheel -wheel, clean racing action no Absolutely they turn in to not. watch a glorified demolition derby but are where two where two dudes from north carolina punch the shit out of each other and the track workers have to come in and intervene Either that or they sit back and watch <laughs> while, while shotgun and a Budweiser. Um, I think it, there is a place, there's a time and a place for chaos shit show races. Yeah. Um, but 20 straight laps of caution for a total of 47. I mean, there was a point, there was like a half hour in that race where we were just watching cars circulate. That's that, bad. That, that can't be entertaining under Oriel any circumstances. Oriel Servia was putting the, put the boots of the field in that Corvette. <laughs> he somebody he ran the thing out of fuel. Yeah, not a very it, good advertisement for the first hybrid Corvette. <laughs> they they ran so many pace laps, they ran it out of the, fuel. The one angle everybody will tell me about how great IndyCar is is that how great the racing is. When that side of your product lets you down, it what falls, else do you have? It falls like a house of cards very, very quickly. And that wasn't even in the top three of problems of this race weekend, which I think we can now segue into yeah, because because we have because we now have a double feature of drivers behaving badly we have santino ferrucci trying to make an enemy of everyone in practice and qualifying and we have augustine canapino ricardo junco sneak dissing and actually dissing uh other drivers after the race um which uh, one do we uh, want to talk about first i ferrucci first I think we'll go the first incident first. So, uh, yeah, because uh, during this is, this is kind of a carryover, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Was, this, this was a thing that has been brewing kind of since indie practice. Yes. Where Santino has been beefing with people during practice, fighting over track space and doing your usual, you know, online comment thread you know bully insults towards those people first it was Grosjean well huh. so he gets so he gets in it with Kyle Kirkwood and Colton Herta and Ferrucci actually went and shoved Kirkwood after the uh the practice session just before qualifying <laughs> When interviewed about it afterwards, he referred to Kirkwood and Herter as, quote, having a little boyfriend teammate. Now, this is significant because this was also the the 1st of June when this happened. The first day of Pride, Month. of Pride Month, you know, June is considered Pride Month for most countries in the world. And, you know, IndyCar had unveiled its public campaign for Pride Month and being a part of that. And as you can imagine, it didn't exactly go over well on X in regards to that. And so, of course, the same day Ferrucci makes a homophobic remark in regards to two Andretti drivers. Wonderful. Um, the day afterwards, IndyCar had a meeting with Ferrucci expressing their displeasure with Ferrucci's comments, of which he would later go on to apologize for. Um, IndyCar considered the matter closed at that point, quote, unless he does it again. Um, 
let's talk about it. And- uh, I, I think it is like crazy that we find a situation where not even Townsend Bell can really like defend this. Because well, he will, he will go out and like he, he will, will he and- will knuckle down, put in the elbow grease to give Santino Frucci the benefit of the doubt. I, let's just rip the bandage off and like get down to brass tacks, gentlemen. Uh, I know uh, I know what everybody is going to say after this. Oh, Colton Herta said, oh, Santino Ferrucci was finishing top 10, was only finishing 20th with Penske equipment. Well, Colton Herta crashes and Ferrucci finished tonight. na 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 boo boo. You uh, know, the, the first thing I want to point out here, and this might be remarkable, and don't say this bit out loud, Santino Ferrucci is actually having a really good season. <sighs> he's had four top 10 finishes this year. He's 12th in the points. He's having a yeah. really good season. There's no getting around it. He's, I'll give the little shit this. He's driving well, which kind of makes it all the more embarrassing. He feels the need to go out of his way to be so. What? There's two things that annoy me about this primarily watching this all go down. Number one, Ferrucci completely losing his rag for incidents that he is ultimately responsible for. Right? It's like he. It's like he cannot see any way that he's in the wrong. And I find that alarming. What's doubly concerning to me is that Foyt's team is getting defensive about it to the point where a member of his own team is going with the going with the crybaby gestures as Grosjean talks to the media, the same media that wants to over-promote the ever-loving shit out of Ferrucci at every turn because this series is so desperate for a villain. It's so desperate to have a heel character because we're letting Ferrucci basically cut wrestling promos at this point. Yeah, you know what this is? This is like, there's going to be a lot of racing people that listen to this podcast, don't like have any knowledge of like contemporary wrestling nowadays. I liken Santino to like trying to do his best impersonation of Maxwell Jacob Freeman, MJF from All League Wrestling, who... Mm. Especially in his early days in all elite wrestling, there was not an angle to which he will not stoop to elicit cheap heat, draw a, a negative reaction from the crowd and his fellow competitors. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. this is what it feels like Santino Ferrucci is doing, except without like half the charisma. All the goodwill, all the fact that it's just a staged product. Or the it's, muscle or, or mass, the fact, or the tan. Or the mm-hmm. fact that this has been an ongoing thing. Yeah. You know, ever since, basically. What is he most notable for? Well, uh, in Formula F2? One circles, he's best. He's most notable for crashing into his then teammate, Argent Mighty, that we believe that he and his father both racially abused on the down low. And then and then his checks bouncing and him leaving Formula Two in disgrace. And that's after why he races into to car. run. After failing to run a 34 felony count, uh, make America great again from jail (laughs) livery. With with, with Um, a mobile phone in his cockpit. With a mobile phone in his cockpit, which, as you know, unless unless it's a race where the Daytona 500 uh, goes very long because you lit the track on fire is unacceptable. Can I just Uh, say something? Can I I interject something as well? Sure. Uh, That there is that there are so many people that want Santita Ferrucci to be like, the bad boy, the the number, the apex bad boy of the series. Like you got to start winning things because Paul Tracy could at least back it up by winning races and a championship. There's Santino there's also Ferrucci. levels to this, RJ. Because yeah. look, you can be you can be the heel and you can be the bad boy all you want. You see, and even Bush and Hamlin, and even if you can't seven. back it up, there's a line that you don't go over. Yeah, now, absolutely. Normally, this terminology shouldn't be tolerated at any time of the year because it's childish bullying and it's homophobia. Yeah, um, he's not straight up calling him slurs, but it's like that. It's like that subtle homophobia. It's, it's that subtle kind of comment that you hope just ca- lands just enough that people get it, but not that people dig into it further. I need to point this out real quick as well. If you're belittling someone on who they may or may not love as a human being, it is homophobia. Do not try and play this down as if it was just a joke. It's yeah, not it's funny. It's not a fucking joke, and it's not it's, acceptable. It's in, not funny, and it's it, and it's not it's, fair to judge people based on who they are or who who they choose to love or choose not to love. It is no, homophobia. But, but it, but there is no that. argument here. It's just that, right? 
the fact that it was then said on the first day of June, which again, for most of the world, is the beginning of Pride Month, puts it under that much more of uh, it, it, it. It puts the spotlight on it even more so, and you wonder, given he only got an apology out after IndyCar dragged him aside and said, "You cut that shit out right now." Given how casually it came out, what does he say in private circles about the LGBTQ community? Well, I can't imagine it's anything different from the kind of shit that him and his father were saying about our Jemini behind his back. Yep. And, and to his face, if we if rumors are to be believed. Yeah. And behind his back and to his face. And, and that's the thing. He knows what he's doing here. Of course he does. He and I need to point this out here. Like all of what we've mentioned about Santino Ferrucci and how he behaved in Formula 2 and how he was in Europe, has that ever been mentioned on an IndyCar broadcast? They nope. like people go out of their way to try and like whitewash this. In, like, in fact, it was it was buried because you know, when he first came over here and he was trying to get a footing in IndyCar, it was basically whitewashed as you know, it ju- he just didn't get along with people over there. It didn't work character out. Character issues. Character issues. No, he was a racist asshole to his teammate. He tried to that run he make crashed America. into that after he the crashed race. Into after the race deliberately, and got the boot for. When he and talks the- shit about Romain Grosjean, about oh, it's not Formula One over there. Well, Romain Grosjean got to Formula One. He led races. He got podiums. You never got even close. And I need to I need to make this point as well because I mentioned it in my race review. None of this about Ferrucci has ever been mentioned on a broadcast for whatever reason, you know, innocent or or, or deliberate. It's never been mentioned on a broadcast. When Yuri Vips made his IndyCar debut last year, they had absolutely no problem putting together a PowerPoint presentation about how he got fired from Red Bull's academy for being racist on a Twitch stream. They had no problem pointing that out about Yuri Vips, but they've gone completely quiet about Santino Ferrucci and how he got there in the first place. This is the point I wanted to make. Ferrucci has been an arsehole. No one is disputing that here, right? The worst part is, is that this is also... IndyCar has to take a huge degree of accountability and for, enabling enabling, it. for enabling this behavior and peddling this behavior, almost encouraging this behavior. I remember the Indy Grand Prix. Let's add some hate said Kevin Lee before this race started. It wants Ferrucci to be a villain so badly. You reap what you sow, IndyCar. You want you knew exactly about Ferrucci's history. You guys do you guys do your due diligence. You know what his track record was. You had no problem digging it up for Teo Porsche when he debuted at Long Beach last year. You had no problem digging this up for Yuri Vips when he made his IndyCar Series debut last year, despite the controversy when he joined Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan Racing last year. You could have been honest and sincere about Ferrucci being here, right? You didn't. You chose you showed, not to. You made to. A, a very deliberate, invested choice to not do so. Because and you want him to be a star, and he's not that guy yet. And if anything, he's dropped you further in the mud by being homophobic on main. And then you as a series have elected to punish a comment that put the series into disrepute by slapping his wrist and telling him not to do it again. Yeah, that should have at least been a fine. A stiff. It should at have been minimum, at least been a uh, very, like, very stiff fine. I mean... I mean, when we've seen how NASCAR has approached things like this in the past couple of years, because NASCAR was really no better yeah. for the longest what, what, period of what time. Was the fir- what was one of the high? What was one of the main segments of the 2021 Daytona 500 pre-race show? It's it's Kyle Larson in a sit-down interview. I believe it was with Emmanuel Acho, a, yeah. a, a it was. black athlete who now works for Fox Sports and. You know, I'm Oof. sure there are a lot of comments that could be said about uh, Emmanuel Acho, but like, you know, it was it was a very it was a very hard hitting interview that Kyle Larson had to face because that was his first race back after being indefinitely suspended and then reinstated for racism during a Twitch stream. Asgard yeah. was at least willing to confront it, and Kyle Larson was at least willing to show contrition. Santino Ferrucci is like 
ever shown contrition out of any of all this? You see smile. He has smiled through it all with that same grin because he knows that this, there's just not there's no consequence to it. Well, that's the point. NASCAR parked Larson for a year. And IndyCar gave him a, hey, don't do that again. Lawson was racist on <coughs> not even on an not even on a NASCAR broadcast. He was racist outside of that, and they parked him for a year. Ferrucci I mean, was I, homo- <laughs> was Ferrucci was homophobic on an IndyCar broadcast and faced no disciplinary action. They're probably just saying it like you know we're lucky that this was only a peacock because this session aired yeah. on NBC. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in the person interview, it was almost like a nervous, more like a nervous laugh, like, oh, rather than, you it's know. It's that awkward, ner- it's that nervous lack where awkwardness is like just like, God, please get me know. out of here. Yeah, that that I don't really know how to carry this. And again, just smiling through it all. Um, And the worst thing is, is that none of this is a surprise. And I can't expect it to change. Yeah. At least, like, because the other big thing happened after the race. Um, during the race, one of the many, many incidents that we had, Teo Porcher hit Augustine Canapino's car going into turn three. It happens sometimes. I watch the incident back, and it's just like, it's, it's, it's dumb driving from Teo. I get that, but it doesn't recall, uh, warrant Ricardo Junco's, Augustine Canapino's boss and engineer, calling Porsche a, quote, son of a thousand horrors in retaliation. It doesn't that justify... Is a, that is a wild line, by the way. God, <laughs> I, I mean, out of context, that is a wild that is line. crazy. Canapino's heart of your fans attack Porsche on social media, including death threats, just like they did with Callum Eilat. McLaren and Junco's Hollinger Racing released a combined statement condemning the behavior. Canapino himself wrote a very bizarre statement addressing the hate including gaslighting the accusations of death threats and telling Porsche to, quote, accept the abuse. IndyCar only responded to multiple journals requests and announced denounced the activity. We don't know anything else behind, beyond that. Well, at the same time, there's another little component to this. Um, well, for the first time maybe ever, an individual has a reason to buy uh, the artist formerly known as Twitter Blue, because we could see Augustine Canapino's Twitter likes and he was liking tweets and has still been liking tweets, um, mocking Porsche for his response to the death. I would have at least, cause like last time this happened, I gave Augustine Canapino all the benefit of the doubt. Do I regret it? Not that much, but I'm really disappointed in the way he acted here. Like I would have at least respected Canapino more if after the race, he just, Went out and tried to start a shoving match with Teo Porsche instead of just. I, I would have actually di- respected that more. So instead of just like snake dissing his way through the next like ninety six hours of social media with the with the craziest of his that, that, local that, fans. Uh, R- RJ, that that uh, that statement from Canapino was a bigger waste of electricity than the board ape NFTs. The, 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 that's the wildest thing about all this to me. Canapino was the victim here. He was legitimately punted by Teo Porsche in this, and he's come off far worse because of the way he and his fan base have acted on social media. And now, his boss. And his boss. And look, some things I need to point out here. This is the third time this has happened in 14 months. This happened at Long Beach last year when Ilot and, Paul, and, when Ilot and Canapino were running one and two briefly at Long Beach when they were off sequence pit wise. And the Canapino fans acted up about this when they, on the Argenti- Argentina's leading sports journos was inciting a lot of the bullshit in regards to Ilot, who had done nothing wrong in that scenario. And it happened again at the end of last season in Laguna Seca when Canapino was, I'd argue, more accountable for the incident between him and Callum that ruined a potential Canapino top five finish in that race. And then we found out after the fact that Ricardo Junkos basically placed the team order, which you're not allowed to do in IndyCar, to basically say, protect Canapino side of the garage because they were trying to get both cars in the leader's circle. Um, oh, yeah, that was a very, co- it was a very costly coming together. Definitely. This is the third time in just over a year 
this has happened. And it re- the second time it revealed a very ugly public falling out between Canna Milo and Ricardo Junkos that led to Junkos holding on to Callum's contract and then sacking him two months after the season was over, leaving him unable to get a job on the grid again for 2024, which has led him to now driving for Jota over in the WEC. Now, which is crazy because that ended up being better for him. He's now a winner in that series, and he's gotten a cup of coffee with Aaron McLaren, which we all thought was going to be the end game anyway. But this is like a rare level of vindictiveness to hang on to someone's contract to the point where you know you're putting them out of the series. That's what that's what that's what the arrow guy. That's what Aaron McLaren did with James Hinchcliffe a few years back. Yeah, it's it's nasty it's, it's work. Weird. It's, it's nasty work, and they know exactly what they're doing. And this is the problem about this. You know what I wrote about this last week. You know what makes me really sad. Junkos was meant to be a wonderful feel-good story. It was meant to be about Ricardo giving up everything he had as an Argentine immigrant to come to Florida and gamble on bringing his own kart team up and climbing up the North American motorsport ladder to get to the point where they could run a competitive team in the biggest open wheel series in this continent. That would have been a, it's, it's a wonderful feel Great. good story of, de- of determination yeah. and perseverance. The, the darlings of this sport five years ago, when a br- a car built out of spares across the garage driven by Kyle Kaiser, who was only in for this series for a cup of coffee. Yep. And they bump out the giant. They bump out Fernando Alonso and McLaren, the well-documented disaster month of May that they had in 2019. And they were the little team that could. And they did. They had to go away. They died during COVID. They died. This team died. They had, they used to have a sports car program. That, that's gone. They, their IndyCar program died and was reborn. And not to mention, Augustine Canapino's father passed away in 2021 due to COVID-19, and one of his dying wishes was to make sure that his son got an opportunity in that car. He's a family friend of Ricardo Junkos's, and Augustine got to carry out that wish. Another, again... And he was very good last year. An incredibly likable, humble... Argentine fellow who had learned English in just a matter of months, spoke fluently, and always came off as genuinely happy and humbled by the experience and happy to be there. He was a shining example of the good of wanting to be an IndyCar and coming up from Argentine stock car racing, where people were just excited at the mere mention that Scott McLaughlin might come over for a race at some point in that year. And it didn't quite work out, but the whole point of this was, this was meant to be a wonderful feel good story for IndyCar and for immigration in general. And all that goodwill is now gone. Like it's, it tells me that Ricardo Yunkos is too emotionally invested and not in the state where he should be. This hands on with with hit with the driver that he sees as his number one. You're insulting. You're, you're firing personal insults towards Teo Porcher's mother, calling him the calling him the son of a thousand horse. That's a disgusting thing to say on a team radio. Horrible. It's amazing. Santino Ferrucci so privileged he just got gifted not being the most morally disgusting IndyCar driver. You know, That's it's a cr- horrible it's, thing to say. It's. it's Putting out such a half is putting out a gaslighting statement, we'll call it what it is. While at the same time, we can see your Twitter likes and we can see that you're liking tweets mocking poor Cher. Do you think we're stupid? The, it, apparently so. You must really think we're stupid. One, people could see your likes. Two, your own fans don't care when they're publicly outing themselves and some of them are taking pride in sending Teo Porcher death threats. Oh, and by the way, Augustine, uh, direct messages exist for those people out there that want to say, I don't see any death threats, as if DMs aren't a thing. Um, it's, yeah. the same thing. it's the same thing with fucking Abu Dhabi 21, what happened to Nicholas Latifi. Yeah, well, Nicholas Latifi, who are, 
Nicholas Tiffany was one of the nicest people in Formula One, was universally at least liked for a genuinely nice off-track persona, was funny and charming and likable, and he had to hire private security for him and his partner because he was receiving death threats from angry Hamilton fans. Why was he receiving death threats from angry Hamilton fans? Well, he was in the... He, he caused the incident that led to that safety car in the final race of the season. And you can say, yeah. oh, Nicholas Latifi wasn't that good of a driver. I mean, he wasn't. No, for, he for, wasn't but- for those who, you know, for those who uh, listen to the show regularly, you know, occasionally we have uh, IndyCar journalist Christopher DeHardy on, and he put out a, a fantastic piece on Front Stretch last night, actually, uh, ran it by me before he uh, ended up putting it up and breaks the both of these incidents, both Ferrucci and Canapinos down very well. And it's when you tell someone to ch- you need to choose to ignore it. That's not on them. They're your fans. Ultimately, like, you cannot stop another grown adult from doing horrible things. That and I and I still maintain that that's you know you can take some degree of accountability for that, but ultimately you cannot stop another grown ass human being from being a horrible piece of shit. But to, to basically tell Teo Porsche, let's not forget he's twenty years old. He's a very young man, just Wait. coming into the world. He's he's just come over to the United States. He's moving. He's living in a different country, having to adapt to a totally alien series. Um, and try to adapt and take advantage of a once in a lifetime opportunity to drive the McLaren, and you're telling him to get over it. Can I add another angle on this as well? Sure. It, it definitely because fe- you know me, I'm the super formula guy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when Teo Porcher abruptly left Impul, he said, "Like because I'm doing McLaren, I cannot come back to super formula for the rest of the season." I feel like. A lot of the Japanese fans took that very, very personally. Like it was a front to them that they felt the tail was too good to race for us. And so he's going to go off to IndyCar before he'd ever proven himself. His one race was basically a write off. He went off at the corner known as Dunlop, formerly known as Dunlop, and his race was pretty much a wash. <laughs> right. And I think he could have gone better if he had like stuck with it. But I feel like a, there are a number of Japanese fans who took this way too personally and acted way out of line thinking that, oh, Teo's too good to race for us. He ran from the challenge. He won't apologize to the Japanese fans for leaving us high and dry. And like, yeah, it it's, sucks. It's just, it's that really it's poisonous side of, of sports tribality that just... It it's just it, corrodes everything it touches. It's entitlement. It's, it's it's acting like they believe the driver owes you something, and that's not how sports work. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, back in 1991, there was another highly touted young driver that I'm sure would have loved to stay around in All Japan at 3000 for longer had he not gotten another opportunity to come up. You might know him as seven-time Formula One world champion Michael Schumacher. It just happens. Sorry for this tangent of Super Formula should be an airport where it can be a final destination and a connecting point. I just need to insert that in there. But but like this, we now have this team that was the darling of the garage five years ago, the ultimate underdog story. And they now risk just, they now risk being actually the villains for actual deplorable shit. Here's, here's a question that I don't think anyone else other than me has asked. What's the H and J chart? It's Brad Hollinger, the guy that's pumping in the money. Is he just asleep at the wheel while money flows out of his bank account? <laughs> I mean, have we seen him at the racetrack? Not often. Not, not often. He's an absentee owner, and it just seems like he's unaware of like any of this that's going on. What's happening with this McLaren <laughs> commercial partnership? Is it to the point where yeah. Zach Brown's just thinking of like, are we just at the point where it's just like it's a matter of Zach Brown just like figuring a way to get out of this deal? Because Tony well, Kanan's not impressed. Zach Tony, Brown is not impressed. Yeah, like, Brown, I did not. Zach, Zach, Zach Brown put out a statement. Uh, do you realize how crazy a situation has to be for me to just 
agree with Zach Brown on anything. Do you know Zach how crazy Brown. it is for me to like, I understand Zach Brown's decision making and I still do not like the way they treated David Malukas on the way out. <laughs> yeah. Zach and Brown both, came like, out publicly to defend his driver and say it's, it, it's cowardly and it's pathetic. And, and I, yeah. I couldn't agree Kanan more. put out a tweet about it. Um, <laughs> multiple, and, multiple and other. And like, I mean, I'm sure Callum Eilat's probably looking at this like, huh. First time. Callum, Callum responded to, to Teo on Twitter directly saying, keep your chin up, buddy. It makes you stronger. He knows. That's a man who knows. That's a man who deleted <laughs> his Twitter publicly for for several months because he got so much abuse from Canapino fans. He couldn't bear being on the platform anymore. And, and look at it like this. Y'all are not those guys, Yonkos. If you want, if, if this, if this ever gets to a point where it gets toxic out on track you are not a you are not an entity that indycar will protect like santino ferrucci oh no no you're not them grosjean has already been publicly vilified in the eyes of many an indycar group already in his time in this series before he even joined june coast some of that very much unfair ask graham rahal about that but the point i'm getting at here is is that what canapino has done is put on a nice guy act. And I find that very disappointing that this is how he truly feels about another driver in the series behind the smiles and the sometimes broken English. This is what he truly thinks when he's been given the time to write a statement. And he could have said anything, could have said nothing, quite frankly. And he probably he would have been, been better be- off saying nothing. And that's Nobody at this team has crisis PR. They said they hired crisis PR. When I see it, I'll let them know. It's is bullshit. It crisis PR when the owner is the one on the radio hurling insults? Like that, that to me, like, again, is it is a crisis Ferrucci, PR Ferrucci when should have been fined. R- Canapino RJ, should have been hit in the pot. RJ, is a R- crisis PR when it's Wednesday, uh, June 5th, and Canapino still liking tweets, mocking poor share. And Not IndyCar really. did nothing. IndyCar only came out of a public statement because multiple journalists basically had to reach out and ask them for a comment. And ultimately, like, and I think IndyCar's angle on this is that it's fans. What are you going to do? But again, Junkos and, Junkos and Canapino would have been better off saying nothing rather than digging their heels in. It's a controversial take as, and, and in the eyes of many. But as far as I'm concerned, you need to punish the team. If you're not prepared to take enough m- measurable steps to discard yourself from this horrible behavior you need to be hit in the wallet or you need to have leader circle points taken off you because this is ridiculous yeah I, mean, I, I can't i can't myself i can't support penalizing a team for the action of it you're putting the series in but, this repute camp but i can support penalizing them when they refuse to condemn such hate I can I mean, absolutely support they, that. The thing is, they have put out statements, but the thing is, they're not doing anything to prevent this from... They're not doing anything it's proactive. The same, it's the same copy and paste shit they've done the last two times it's happened. Like, we're going if, it to were, if it were up to me, like, I'd strongly consider telling Ricardo Junkos, stay at stay at the headquarters in Indianapolis uh, until you can learn to check your emotions. Oh. Yeah. I I would not argue with that whatsoever. I would be taking fine with points and money out, let me, let out let of the Indy car. When you talk, we've seen what NASCAR has fined in the past. If that was said in English on the Indy car broadcast, oh baby, that would be like a one hundred thousand dollar fine if that was NASCAR. Easy, easy. That's, that'd be more than the twenty five points Junior got for saying shit in victory lane. Yeah, um, it's just I'm just like man. if. I, I want Can, a Canapino. Canapino is not a native English speaker. If he needs help with a statement, get him help with the statement. Because that's got statement plenty was of people that it. can help him. It's not an excuse. It's he's not got, a fucking excuse. He's got plenty of people that can help him write a statement. And, and if Jinkos really have hired crisis PR, why are you not using them in a situation like this? It's bullshit. Someone needs to get a hold of Augustine and say, get the fuck off Twitter. You're not helping. If anything, you're making your team look even more disingenuous. And I wholeheartedly agree with RJ. I want to like Jinkos. I want to like Augustine Canapino. He's 
he's burned his goodwill with me forever because that was such an ignorant fucking statement that I don't ever want to root for him again, quite frankly. Like, it, it was disgraceful. Like, it's, it's, like, it's one thing to try... And I think I could see what Canapino was trying to do in that statement. I could see the whole... It was the whole, don't lump all the Argentinians under the same bus. And I understand that to a degree, and yes... And, I still, th- and I still think that's true the second yeah, time but, around, because yeah, this is... Ab- this, absolutely. Like, uh, one Like, one we cannot... We cannot prove... We cannot... We cannot rag on IndyCar's xenophobic, closed-door boys club on one hand, and then say... Every Argentinian is like this. Build the wall and make them pay for it in the other. Absolutely. But at the same time, when it's Wednesday afternoon and Yunkos himself has said nothing since, when he's the one who made the radio comment, that's not acceptable. You can't, you, but you also, can, you also say, you also, I understand and I do agree, you cannot generalize all Argentinians for making these comments. Well, at the same time, Absolutely. You, cannot, you cannot say that in your statement and then accuse Teo Porsche of gaslighting and lying about taking death threats. It's bullshit. It's, it's, if you it's want exactly us, you just said, you <laughs> just said, oh, well, I haven't seen any death threats, so they must not be happening. DMs exist. If you want us to give you the benefit of the doubt, why can't you give the same to Teo Porsche and believe him? Anyone? Um, I yeah, no, I it's and, it's it's awful. It's bullshit, and it's and, it's, and there's plenty of people. And, and to go back, it's there's plenty of people working at Yonkos Hollinger who I'm sure do not need this drama and this bullshit. Absolutely. And the not. driver and their owner has put them in the situation. They are one of the hardest working groups in all of motorsport because they've had to be. They've had to crawl from nothing and then nothing again when the team died. But behaving like this, refusing to condemn this behavior, acting like that on the radio, you won't be around for very long. No, because what what happens if Brad Hollinger suddenly wakes up and realizes, hang on, happen- I've got a what crisis in my own McLaren- team. I better pull my money. RJ, what happens when McLaren decides our partnership with you is not worth it? I can imagine that's coming sooner rather than later. I have no insider knowledge. That's just a gut feeling. And this team's already hard up for sponsors. Yeah, they're, they're basically I, running to livery with minimal sponsorship cars, even at the 500 minimal sponsorship. There's going to come a point where sponsors are not going to want to invest in this team. Drivers are not going to want to sign for them. And Ricardo Yonkos, you who to be, built up everything out, who built uh, all this whole thing from nothing, is only going to have himself and his emotional instability to blame for this. RJ, do you want to put your name on the side of the cars? that are involved with this drama i wouldn't i would i wouldn't right now like can you imagine what what not when you got established teams like prema trying to get their way in not with pratt and miller you know trying to put together a program for the future not not in this climate here Will it's, it be worth it if ferrucci and canapino get into it with each other at the track later this year <laughs> It'll be like an actual, it's what happened, you know, to, to paraphrase David Emmett, that will be what happens when all the fuckery collapses in on itself into a fuckery black hole. Mm-hmm. I did not expect better from Santino Ferrucci because that's the guy he's been, and we've known he's been since 2018. I expected a lot better of Augustine Canapino. I yeah, expect a first, lot better of Ricardo Yunkos. You know, the, uh, the first time... I can put that down to fans. The second time, fine. It's the third time, three times in fourteen months. You have not done enough. Point blank. You, you need you need to step up, and you need to, to you need to put out a statement and get your fans to knock it off. Whether they do or not, that's on them. But the fact that you failed to condemn it. That you've uh, that you've gone into your likes and encouraged it, it just kind of, it just comes off as fake, man. And I think it's in IndyCar's best interest to take a firm stance. Oh, no kidding, Jay. Like, it, yeah, but bar, bar. Where is the bar? It's like you're coming the off. The bar of is lower rate. than the average speed of this race in Detroit. 
78 miles an hour that I, I do a little bit more than that on the freeway. Not nothing over eight though, but like, God, it's, it, it's in the best interest yeah. of the series. Like get its stuff together because like not all, not all publicity is good publicity. In a week that you were punching up at Formula One on multiple fronts after a great Indy 500, the fact that you had an embarrassing race on track and that was your third most toxic story is really not a good look for this series and its uppity nature. Let's put it this way. Like every major journalistic motorsport player in Europe all wrote about whether that race was an embarrassment due to the driving standards and also wrote multiple hit pieces about the conduct of Ferrucci and Canapino on track. Including Jack Bending at the race, who's a friend of mine, and yeah. wrote a, a fantastic piece breaking down that this is completely unacceptable. Like, and... It, it's, it's, uh, it's beyond toxic. Like if when it gets to the point where it is now systemic and you begin to expect it with those drivers, forget being reactive. You have to start getting proactive with how you manage their behavior. Yeah, you need and to it hit this never team. Never need yeah. to get to that point. Yeah, you need to hit this team of extreme punishments if they're not going to take the mitigating steps. It's that simple. Look, we, we, we're just about done here. Like it's it's it's, it's IndyCar did not need this shit. Like and and I, I hate. I'm not going to get a chance to talk about this series until after Road America because I'm going to be traveling for something else. <laughs> oh, God, I, I I am just sick and tired of it. I it's really frustrating. Am. I want Road America to be better. It's this weekend. It will. I'm almost certain it will be. I sincerely hope it will I, be. So I, it can only be better. Like. Than- it, I'm a big fan of, of Road America. It's my favorite track on the IndyCar calendar. I'm sure it will be a much better race, but we just we just don't need this shit. I it's as simple as that. We none of this shit we need. None of this weekend turned out good for IndyCar. The only thing that made me smile about this entire goddamn weekend was that Louis Foster won in, in Indy next, and that was about it. What a hey now, shout out to Miles Rowe with the nineteenth of fourth. Brilliant comeback. comeback from Miles Rowe. Brilliant comeback. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad he's, he's he's having a, a solid first year in Indy next. But God fucking damn it, this weekend was so unnecessary. Yeah, uh, it's Road and, America and, next week. And don't and don't get defensive about it with the series. You should expect better. Yeah. You as I, fans, we as fans deserve better than the we, the weekend and the preceding three days before we recorded this of gestures wildly all of this. If IndyCar wants people to take its series more seriously on, on the grand stage as a racing series, this is the sort of shit you need to nip in the bud right away. Because we as F1 fans, we have no problem calling out this shit on a weekly basis. You don't want the same example to come over here. You ain't in the position to be pissing fans away. Formula One has to lose a lot more cogs out of that machine for people for it to actually start having problems. And hell, F1 is rolling in it right now. IndyCar doesn't have that luxury. Do better. Everybody involved needs to do better. I've been trying to disagree Harrison. with that. I've been Dre Harrison, Road America next week, alongside F1's Canadian Grand Prix and a Le Mans preview coming up next week as well. We'll try our very best to get that out. Keep an eye on our social media for when we find the date for it. I'm just going to forget this fucking weekend never happened. I've been Dre Harrison, Dave Bernard, Joe O'Connell, and Cam Buckley. Thank you very much for listening. Sayonara. Just, just get me to the Lamar preview, man. I'm tired of this. Give me to the Lamar preview on a TGV.